Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to speak uh, at this CLIO conference. And also, it's a great honor to be selected as a Gordon Memorial speaker. I will talk about integrated quantum photonics in diamond and silicon carbide. As all of you know, for all quantum technologies, and this includes quantum repeaters, quantum networks, quantum computers, and simulators, we need the following ingredients. We need homogeneous long-lived qubits with preferably optical interfaces, and we also need efficient interconnects, electromagnetic interconnects, but again, preferably optical interconnects in order to build long-distance quantum networks. And today I will tell you how we plan to implement both of these key ingredients. Let me first say a few words about our choice of homogeneous long-lived qubits. We're primarily focusing on optical interface semiconductor spin qubits. If you're familiar with superconducting qubits in microwave cavities, uh, our spin qubits in optical cavities, such as color centers in diamond and silicon carbide, pretty much exhibit the same physics. The same equations govern the behavior of both of these systems. However, there are some key differences. Superconducting platform relies on large structures and traditional microfabrication, so it's easy to make them all the same. However, they also rely on superconductors, operation at microwave frequencies, and have no direct optical interface. On the other hand, uh, our spin qubits, uh, color centers in optical cavities, in diamond or silicon carbide, rely on semiconductors. They have a possibility of operation at higher temperatures of few Kelvin, excellent optical interfaces, and um, maybe most importantly, the number of two qubit gate operations per spin qubit coherence time exceeds that of superconducting qubits, meaning that you can implement larger depth quantum circuits once you scale the system up. However, uh, this particular platform relying on color centers in optical cavities is smaller uh, relative to superconducting structures by a factor of few orders of magnitude, a factor of thousand or more. Uh, and that means that we have to rely on more sophisticated nanofabrication techniques. So it's also more challenging to make all of these systems and qubits the same. Nevertheless, um, the community has made a great progress. Uh, my group primarily focuses on color centers in diamond, uh, such as silicon vacancies and tin vacancies. And in this one slide, I will give you a state of the art of where we stand in terms of scaling the systems up and quality of qubits. With silicon vacancies in diamond, uh, me and others have already demonstrated excellent photonic interfaces uh, by embedding them in optical cavities. Um, we can also show that they have very small spectral broadening of only 30 gigahertz uh, for different color centers of the same chip. And um, we have also shown that we can compensate for up to 100 gigahertz of spectral broadening for, for different color centers by driving them uh, with off-resonant lasers and relying on Raman scattering, a very well-known technique in atomic physics. So we can compensate for much more than the spectral broadening, meaning that simply by driving these color centers with different lasers, you can interface them um, on the same chip. And also recently, uh, we have been looking into tin vacancies in diamond as an alternative to silicon vacancies, uh, because tin vacancy color centers um, can operate potentially at elevated temperatures. They can exhibit all of the advantages of silicon vacancies, but at higher temperatures of few Kelvin, meaning that you don't really have to do experiments in dilution refrigerators. And also more importantly, they have higher internal quantum efficiencies than silicon vacancies, implying higher counts and, and better scalability. Um, so with thin vacancies, uh, recently we have shown that we can actually um, implement them uh, in regular arrays with minimal damage to the lattice and, and uh, which implies at the same time better properties of the color centers. And if you're interested in learning about details of this technique, please see a clear talk by my student, Alison Ruger, on Tuesday afternoon. So this technique, which we refer to as SIG, uh, sh short for shallow ion implantation and subsequent diamond overgrowth, is illustrated on this slide. Uh, we start from high purity diamond sample, which we mask. 
uh, then do shallow ion implantation at low energies and subsequently grow high uh, purity diamond on top. And here you see regular arrays and there is a striking difference between thin vacancy core centers that are grown by high energy implantation as the ones shown here and the ones grown by um, shallow implantation uh, that I'll show you in a moment. So here you see shallow implanted diamond color centers. They have much narrower line width. Uh, some of the color, some of the lines in the spectrum disappear in that case implying much uh, higher purity of the lattice and lower damage to the lattice. The other uh, color center of our choice for the experiment is a silicon vacancy in 4H polytype of silicon carbide. Uh, this is just a simply missing silicon atom from silicon carbide lattice, uh, which can exhibit uh, transitions uh, in the range around 900 nanometers, uh, so-called B1 or B2 uh, transitions, depending on the position of the missing silicon atom in the lattice. Uh, we've been collaborating uh, on the experimental front with a group of your brush drop in Stuttgart and uh, on the theoretical side with Sophia Economy from Virginia Tech. Uh, these color centers exhibit long uh, spin coherence time of 20 milliseconds. People have demonstrated uh, indistinguishable photon generation from such color centers and 65 megahertz uh, line width of transitions um, where lifetime limit is 35 megahertz. These are very stable transitions. As you can see here, they're stable for, for many, many hours. Um, and these two transitions indicate spin one half and spin three half uh, transitions. And we can also stark shift them, use DC stark shift to shift them um, in compensate all of the homogeneous broadening. So this is a stark shifting of 200 gigahertz compensating all of the broadening in the system. So despite uh, being uh, uh, able to start shift them by um, external electric field, these color centers are still immune to any um, changes in the environment, making them extremely stable. Uh, so going back to color centers in silicon carbide, um, apart from DC start shifting, we also have a capability to do high speed modulation and control of the spectrum of this color center, as you can hear in greater detail in the Clio talk by my student Alex White, uh, also on Tuesday afternoon. Uh, the idea here is to uh, use high speed um, electric field modulation at the rates that are larger than the decay time of the color center as opposed to the traditional DC stark shifting, which we explained before, in this case, you are theoretically predicting to see flow K eigenstates of the system. So as you're increasing the drive frequency, these new flow K eigenstates emerge and their uh, frequency can be changed by changing the drive free, driving field frequency and also strength of the driving field. And indeed, we also see that in the experiment, this beautiful spectrum of the flow K eigenstates. Why is this interesting? This is interesting because this idea of locate driving uh, can be used to spectrally reconfigure quantum emitters, namely by changing uh, the composition of the driving microwave field, we can completely reconfigure spectrum of the quantum emitter. And again, in his Clio talk on Tuesday, Alex will tell me more about it, but I will show you also briefly in a few slides how we're doing that. For example, here for this particular driving field, you can see on the right hand side, the corresponding spectrum of the quantum emitter as a function of the increasing drive frequency. As you are changing the composition of the driving microwave field, the spectrum of your quantum emitter is completely changing. Um, as you can see here, adding more microwave components makes spectrum more complex. And then you can start optimizing the driving field, driving microwave field, and making the spectrum more asymmetric, changing it completely by making some of the components more dominant than the other components. We have demonstrated this experimentally as well. Here you see the experimental spectrum of the silicon vacancy and silicon carbide. Um, theoretical spectrum on the, on the left hand side and here we show experimental result for the driving frequency which is illustrated with a dashed line uh, so your experimental spectrum is completely reconfigurable at the bottom it's decomposed to the transitions corresponding to spin three half and spin one half manifolds and if you change the composition of your microwave driving field the spectrum completely changes 
as shown here. And of course, by tuning the frequency, you can completely tune it and reconfigure it. So that gives you um, an idea how you can actually compensate for any inhomogeneous broadening in the system. But apart from that, also spectrally reconfigure your emitters to match them to something else in the system, um, to match them to particular other emitters or to your optics and resonators and so on. So now going back to the other ingredient of all of these quantum technologies, as I told you at the beginning, apart from these homogeneous long lead qubits with excellent optical interfaces, we also need efficient optical interconnects, electromagnetic interconnects, but preferably optical interconnects. Um, so how do we plan to implement that? How do we plan to implement efficient quantum optical interconnects, which are necessary for system level integration? In the past, in our experiments, and also experiments in other groups, you would see the very simple structures interfacing single quantum emitters that often uh, have very, very low quantum efficiency. And this is, these are some of the results from my group, from Diamond and, and Quantum Dot, but the results are pretty similar in other groups as well. So how do we change these efficiencies and push them as close to 100% as possible, which is really necessary for scaling systems up? For this particular problem, we plan to use uh, photonics, uh, in, uh, inverse design for photonics, the method that our team has pioneered over the past uh, decade or more. Um, if you're interested in, in learning more about it, you can hear a Clio talk by my postdoc Kyu Liang on Monday um, at 4 p.m., today at 4 p.m. Um, but the main idea is that photonics can be efficient, robust, and insensitive to errors. And here uh, we've been relying on the software suite that we developed called Stanford Photonics Inverse Design Software, or SPINS, uh, that several major companies are now using. Uh, you can also download the open source version of this from GitHub uh, SPINS B uh, that my team has developed. And as you can see here in the example of WDM devices, wavelength splitters, uh, we can make them to be compact and robust to errors. So when you measure uh, multiple devices on the same chip, they all perform the same without any post tuning. And recently, we have also shown in collaboration with the plenary speaker, John Bowers, that uh, inverse design is fully compatible with foundry fabrication. So for this three channel wavelength splitter as an example, um, after fabrication in a foundry in photonics, uh, we can show that um, experimental results completely match theory. Uh, so here are experimental results for many different devices and they completely match theory. So, so not only you have a method that can produce robust and efficient photonics, you can also make it um, uh, foundry uh, compatible. Uh, and that's exactly what we've done. So now going back to the idea of quantum photonics, how can you adapt inverse design to quantum photonics? Well, this approach is material independent. Um, so you can, of course, adapt it to your diamond and, and silicon carbide platform and incorporate your uh, fabrication constraints for, for that particular material system and design more efficient devices. So in Diamond, uh, we have uh, adopted fabrication method, uh, uh, which was inspired by the work of Paul Barkley at Calgary and uh, also, also subsequently adopted by Dirk Wund at MIT. And this is the method which relies on isotropic and anisotropic etching of diamond, basically three-dimensional carving of diamond, where you can produce uh, arbitrary shapes which are compatible with inverse design. Um, and as an example of how better structures perform once you optimize them, here is an optimized coupler um, to cavity. Um, traditional notch couplers, which we used in our previous work, have very low efficiency, uh, but in the same footprint, you can implement these optimized vertical couplers. And um, in the experimental results, you can see that notch couplers, after 10 second integration, barely start showing the signal from the cavity, while these vertical optimized couplers show much stronger signal from the cavity. So you have um, 500 fold enhancement in counts without degradation of the cavity Q factor. And that implies a dramatic reduction in experimental time, which is crucial for quantum optics. You cannot really wait forever to detect signals or collect enough single photons. So we started uh, incorporating color centers in these optimized structures. You can hear more about that in the Clio talk by my student, Alison Ruger. Um, 
on Tuesday afternoon. Um, we are focusing uh, for the moment on teen vacancy caller centers for the reasons I explained before, because they're more efficient and can operate at uh, higher temperatures. Um, and here is an example of a teen vacancy caller center, um, which was produced by this shallow ion implantation method uh, and overgrowth that we pioneered. Um, and subsequently, uh, we publicated diamond structures with optimized couplers. Uh, this is a photoluminescence scan. Um, we have performed photoluminescence excitation measurements for the color centers in these diamond beams and have shown that there is no degradation in their mind, although we uh, go through this inverse designed publication process afterwards. Line width of thin vacancy color centers uh, in diamond photonic structures is 13 megahertz on par with the best bulk photoluminescence excitation measurements. The other material that we're looking into is, uh, of course, silicon carbide. I already mentioned that our silicon carbide color centers are other color centers of our interest and choice. And more broadly, we actually think that silicon carbide may be an ideal photonics material. There is no other photonics material that provides all of the features shown here. Strong optical nonlinearity, it's piezoelectric, excellent thermal conductivity, large band gap, silicon compatible, available on wafer scale, and host high quality quantum emitters for quantum technologies. And I'd like to remind you that the workhorse material for uh, photonics today is silicon. Uh, silicon uh, wafers, box silicon wafers were commercialized in 1960s, uh, but silicon on insulator was commercialized only in 2000s, and that's when silicon photonics entered golden age 20 years ago. Um, lithium niobate is another very exciting material for photonics now. Bulk lithium niobate was commercialized in 1990s, but it took 20 years until 2010 to commercialize lithium niobate on insulator, and that's really when this effort on thin film lithium niobate photonics started. But what about silicon carbide? I said that silicon carbide is an ideal photonics material. No silicon or lithium niobate can provide everything that you have here, right? They, they are not really as good for all the applications in photonics as silicon carbide is. And silicon carbide wafers were commercialized in 1990s. Uh, from companies such as Cree, you can get six inch wafers of silicon carbide. But there is no commercial silicon, on insul silicon carbide on insulator. Uh, and that's necessary for photonics, which is why we had to develop a high quality silicon carbide on insulator. Um, the additional requirement is that we cannot use the process that would degrade the quality of the silicon carbide layer. So ion implantation, um, uh, which is necessary for smart cut process, is off the table in this case because it would introduce unintentional color centers in silicon carbide. So we developed a different material, different method for, in, in, for preparing silicon carbide and insulator material, um, where we start from a silicon carbide wafer, uh, which we bond onto oxidized silicon wafer, grind and thin it, um, finally do fine reactive ion etching uh, for final thinning step, and we end up with a thin layer of silicon carbide on insulator um, by a few millimeters by few millimeters in size, but this can be scaled to larger vapors as well, uh, and we can produce high quality quantum photonics here. And at the moment, we have properties of this material that are on par with silicon on insulator and silicon photonics. Here are some examples of uh, structures fabricated, including some inverse design structures fabricated in silicon carbide on insulator. We have quality factors now exceeding 1.2 million at telecommunication wavelengths. I already mentioned that silicon carbide uh, is a very interesting material for other applications. I'll show you in a moment nonlinear and quantum photonics. Uh, but here is an example, for example, of a measurement of uh, resonance measurement. Uh, for uh, resonators in silicon carbide. Um, we measure this through inverse design grading coupler transmission, uh, and we see quality factor of 1.1 million here. Uh, this is a telecommunication wavelength. And if you're interested in learning more about this, uh, please hear a Clio talk by my student, Melissa Gudry, on uh, Thursday, Thursday afternoon. Apart from just photonics, um, as you'll hear from Melissa, we're also focusing on nonlinear photonics. Silicon carbide has really good uh, second order nonlinearity and third order optical nonlinearity. 
Um, we've demonstrated that. We've done second har uh, harmonic uh, generation, but we've also done, um, uh, in this particular case, optical parametric oscillation. Uh, we have eight milliwatts of threshold for OPO on silicon carbide, and we are already seeing Kerr-Combs in silicon carbide, which is very exciting, uh, not only for nonlinear optics, but also for quantum photonics, because you can actually do quantum frequency conversion on the silicon carbide chip. And on the quantum photonic side, uh, we are uh, showing excellent uh, light matter interaction between color centers, silicon vacancies coupled to these silicon carbide resonators. When color center is on resonance with the resonator, we see hundredfold enhancement in its emission uh, as expected. We also see strong reduction in lifetime of that quantum emitter. And we can show from second order correlation measurements that we're indeed doing all of these measurements on a single quantum emitter. It's uh, not done on, on multiple emitters. So strong per cell enhancement. So what is our outlook for these um, integrated quantum photonic networks? We, we think that silicon carbide and insulator provides an excellent platform for integrated quantum photonics. Um, not only you can have high quality emitters embedded in structures on the chip, but you can also uh, do um, on the same chip quantum frequency conversion to match them to telecommunication networks. You don't need other materials uh, such as lithium nitrate. Um, you can also add an additional layer of silicon nitride, for example, on top, uh, which you can use to reconfigure the networks underneath because uh, in all quantum um, computing quantum simulation platforms, you always have imperfections and you always need some level of reconfigurability. That's what people are doing in atomic physics with phasors. That's what they're doing in quantum circuits. So you need uh, another layer where you can fabricate your photonic circuits that would interface only high quality emitters. And um, we also believe now that we can build quantum simulators and you know, potentially even quantum computers on the um, photonic chips uh, by using this optical interface spins. Um, we are collaborating with a group of Ignacio Sirac in Munich on um, the proposal that his group uh, put together a number of years ago primarily in the context of atomic physics systems, but we think now that it is adaptable to solid state uh, emitters, where you have an array of qubits that are coupled to uh, photonic structure underneath or around it, which changes density of states. And by using this platform and changing photonic environment of your, your quantum emitters, you can change the range of interaction of these quantum emitters and basically, um, design the interaction Hamiltonian that you're simulating. Uh, so how do we plan to approach that? Well, our inverse design uh, gives us the opportunity for dispersion engineering, density of optical states engineering. Uh, we can really uh, define the dispersion uh, that we would like to have in the system and design inverse design of structure that supports that inversion, uh, that particular the dispersion within the fabrication constraints of our system. And uh, we can also adapt that to also dispersion resonator, dispersion engineering of micro resonators on trip, um, which is very interesting for frequency combs. Uh, we can define the desired dispersion target and inverse design the structure that supports it. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about this, please hear a Clio talk by my student Gan Ho An. Um, this afternoon, uh, Monday afternoon, right after my talk. And the other ingredient for building quantum simulators on chip is being able to interface a large array of solid state spins. And we think that this is now possible. There will always be some imperfections in the system, but we have enough to turn. We think that we can use the idea of Floquet engineering that I described earlier in order to design spectrum of the system and uh, remove all of the inhomogeneous broadening and imperfections. And even more importantly, we don't think that we need to drive each emitter separately. We think that optimized driving of an ensemble of spins uh, can be used to remove all of the inhomogeneous broadened spins in the system and really have the system behave as a system of uh, homogeneously broadened spins, really like a perfect system. 
So with that, I'd like to close my talk and summarize. Um, I talked about two different platforms for quantum integrated quantum photonics. Uh, we're very excited about both. They have some uh, different advantages and they may be more suitable for different range of applications. Uh, 4-H silicon carbide platform is uh, very interesting, not only for quantum photonics, but also for nonlinear photonics. And we really have some very exciting results there. Um, the other platform uh, is Diamond platform, where emitters are a little bit more mature, but platform is not as scalable as uh, other integrated photonics platform because you have to rely on three-dimensional carving. Um, and finally, uh, for both of these platforms and scaling on any quantum technologies, we think we really need to rely on optimization. And for uh, quantum photonics, we really need to rely on photonic optimization where we have pioneered uh, inverse design approach uh, encapsulated in our software suite spins which is fully compatible with foundry-based fabrication. And let me thank my team and uh, people, our collaborators, people who, co who supported our work. And at this conference, you can hear from a few more people from my group, including Melissa, um, also Alex, uh, who is here, Ganho, uh, and Q, and Alison. Thank you very much for your attention.